thanks for being in worship this morning. We're glad to have you. I want to remind you that God is in control in these days. Over the last couple of months, it's been difficult, not only for our church, but the community and, the, in fact, the whole world. But I want you to know that God is in control. The book of Psalms says that during our anxiety, the consolation is that God gives us joy. And I want you to be reminded of that. We are so glad you have joined us. And this, this is not easy without you. We so miss you guys being in the worship center with us when we're doing this filming. And we hope that we'll be back together soon. But in the meantime, we are offering several options for worship. We have an 8 o'clock drive-in that's actually in the parking lot. We have the worship outside in the Grove. And we also have this Facebook Live on Sunday mornings. On Wednesday nights, we now have an option for the study of the book of Acts with Pastor Brent and Bobby, and you can join us here in the worship venue. We're kind of spreading out so everybody's safe at 6 o'clock on Wednesday nights, or you can also join us on Facebook Live there. Again, we are so glad that you are here, and we'll be even glad when you get back here with us. Welcome to worship. Precious lonely hours, Jesus. 
just let me know that I was still his own. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. And I thank him for the valleys. I thank him for the storms he's brought me through. For if I never had a problem, I wouldn't know that he could solve them. I never know. Welcome to week number three of our series called A Place to Stand. We've been looking at the importance and the power of humility. You know, if we want to change the world the way that God has called us to change the world, we're not going to do it by power. We're not going to do it by political influence. We're not going to do it by pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps. If we're going to make the change that God has called us to make, it's going to happen when we choose to stand on humility. Archimedes said, give me a firm place to stand and a lever to pull and I'll change the world. And the life of Jesus shows us that the place to stand, the, the lever to pull, if we want to move the world in the name of Jesus, is on humility. But I know that even as we talk about humility, there's something in us that just cringes at the thought. There's something that pulls back at the thought that humility is the place to stand, the firm footing to move the world. It seems counterintuitive. It's an upside down way of thinking. But then again, the way of Jesus is an upside down way of living. And so I want to encourage us today, as we look at three verses from Philippians chapter 2, as we see the power and the importance of humility, that if we want to be like Jesus, we're going to have to choose humility. Now, Paul, writing in Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 3, says this. Do not be selfish. Do not be selfish. Now, that's a challenge that we can all accept. That's something that we all need because, let's face it, we all wake up and more days than not, our first thought is me, myself, and I. And if you think that way, I just want you to know you're not the only one. We live in a world that is full of selfish people. But Paul writes to say, don't be selfish because there are real consequences for a me-centered attitude. There's a real consequence for selfishness. You see, anytime we are me-centered, what begins to happen is when we see other people that have something that we think that we need, we we'll begin to get jealous. You ever been jealous of somebody? You see a lot of things going right for them and you wonder, why aren't they going right for me? And rather than praising God for what's happening in their life, you begin to get jealous about what's not happening in yours. Isn't it funny how when we start to do that, we miss all of the good that is happening in our lives because we get focused on the good in someone else's. You see, when that happens, that jealousy that leads us to a sense of grabbiness or of selfishness. We start trying to grab and we don't want to be generous. We don't want to be grace filled. We don't want to give grace to other people because we begin to get short with people when we think that if 
we give to them will miss out for us. This is what the Bible says in James chapter 3 and verse 16. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. You see, when we are me-centered, when you, me, when we choose to put me, myself, and I at the center of our world, what happens is it leads to disorder. In other words, to a place of a way that is not supposed to be. It's not meant to be this way. There is evil, the opposite of what God has intended. You see, when we are me-centered, what starts to happen when we engage with other people is we begin to objectify them. Rather than valuing them the way that God does, we objectify them. We begin to think, how can I use them to get what's best for me? We don't care about the hurt. We don't care about the story. We don't care about the uniqueness. We don't care about the divine fingerprint that's on the heart of someone else because they are simply paper towels. They are paper plates that we use until we don't need any more, and then we let go of them. We start to overlook people don't see people's pain we just see their usefulness you see what if that is ever true in your life or in mine and that's ever true of how we see other people we've missed the divine in them we've missed life as it's meant to be we're standing in the mud we won't be able to move the world for anything because we're not standing in the right place we're standing on selfishness and not on humility and so the Bible points to several ways that we can combat this selfishness, this me-centeredness. Paul doesn't just write and say, don't be selfish. God just doesn't say, don't be selfish, and then leave it to our own devices to figure out how to do it. But instead, the Bible is very clear on how we can fight selfishness in our own lives. In fact, when we choose to have gratitude, to be generous, and to give grace, it's impossible to be selfish. It's impossible to be selfish when we practice gratitude, when we give generously, and when we give grace. Here's what the Bible says about gratitude. In James chapter 1 and verse 17, it says, Do not be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, in whom there is no changing like shifting shadows. You see, every gift, every good and perfect gift comes from God. And when we begin to see the good in our lives, not as something that we are owed, not as something that we are entitled to, but as a gift from God, then all of a sudden we begin to become more thankful. All of a sudden we begin to realize that the God of creation has noticed me. That the Lord, that God who spoke, name, place, and number, every star in the sky took enough time to know your need and then to provide for them. You see, that leads to a place of gratitude. And now we don't focus on what we don't have, but instead we're able to see all that God has given us and all that we do have. The old hymn, count your blessings, name them one by one. What we see, the more thankful that we are, the more that we practice gratitude and are intentional about it, the more that we see we have to be thankful for. Because the more that we see how God has been at work in our lives, all around us, even when we didn't notice it. See, gratitude takes away selfishness because we don't have to grab for more when we realize that everything God has given us is exactly what we need. And the second thing that will remove selfishness from your life and from mine is generosity. It's to practice generosity. See, the more open-handed we are with our time, with our money, with our abilities, the more open-handed we are, the more that we realize that everything we have is already God's, that we don't have to hold on tight to it as if, if we let it go, we'll be left out in the dark. The more generous we are, not only the more thankful it makes us, but what happens is we are able to find even more life. Listen to what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 38 and 39. If your first concern is to look after yourself, you'll never find yourself. Don't let that sink in. If your first thought is me, myself, and I, you're never going to find 
life. But verse 39 says, But if you forget about yourself and you look to me, you'll find both yourself and life. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 24 and 25 says, The world of the generous gets larger and larger, and the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. The one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. Those who help others are helped themselves. You see, when we are generous with all that we have, and we give and we give and we give our lives away, we we don't hold on to it. When we aren't gripping on tight to our own lives, we can't be selfish. We can't be me-centered when I'm looking for the next person that I get to bless with my generosity. You see, that leads to the third thing that takes away selfishness, that combats it, and that's grace. You see, grace is receiving what you don't deserve. Justice, as a way, frame of reference, justice is getting what you do deserve. When you're speeding and you're going 85 miles an hour, you deserve a ticket. When you get it, justice has been served. Some of us know more about that kind of justice than others. Mercy is when you don't receive what you do deserve. When that officer pulls you over and you were doing 85 and that's 60, and he gives you a warning, that officer gave you mercy. He did not give you what you did deserve. But you see, grace goes much further than that. Grace is giving what you don't deserve. That it's to give what you don't deserve, what you haven't earned. And when we are a people who give grace, who have received grace and then give grace, we serve people in ways. They, they didn't deserve that, but we served them anyways. They, they didn't deserve the, 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 the generosity but we were generous anyways. We were, we were profuse with our gratitude to them. They didn't deserve it, but we did it anyways. When we are the kind of people that go, we do it anyways. You see, we can't be selfish because we go looking. Grace goes looking for people to bless. And when that's who we are, we can't be selfish when we're looking for people to bless. Paul continues in verse 3, and he says this. Don't try to impress others. So first he says, don't be selfish. And then the second part of verse 3 says, don't try to impress others. You see, this crazy thing happens, and Pastor Brent pointed this out last week, that when you know who you are, you don't have to prove who you are. When you're confident in who God has made you to be, when you're confident in your standing with Christ, you don't have to go around trying to impress other people and get their praise. Because you see, when you try to impress someone, what happens is if you put me back at the center. When you try to impress somebody, you put yourself back at the center. And then it becomes all about you again. But when you're not worried about impressing someone and you go and serve someone, what happens is you put God at the center. See, when I try to impress people, I am at the center. When I try to serve people, God is at the center. Because the only reason that I can go and serve people is because God has first came and served me. The Bible says in 1 John that we love because God loved us. And we serve because God served us through the Son, Jesus Christ. And so as we think about how do I not try to impress other people, does that mean that I don't work hard? Absolutely not. Does that mean that you don't try to be your best? Absolutely not. What it means is you live as if the world needs what God has done in you. But to do that, you've got to know what God has done in you. Think about all the incredible things, the truths that scriptures point out to us. Now, Paul continues in verse 3. And first he says, don't be selfish. And then he says, don't try to impress others. Don't try to impress others. You know, Pastor Brent pointed this out to us last week, that being humble or standing on humility has nothing to do with being insecure. In fact, it's just the opposite. You can only do it if you're secure in who you are. When you know who God has made you to be, you don't have to prove it. You just get to go and live it. And when you know who you are, you don't have to prove who you are. You see, when you try to impress people, what happens is you put yourself back in the center. You become selfish. 
because you want everyone around to see just how great you are, how smart you are, how talented you are, how far you've come, how much you've achieved, how much you've overcome. And when you put yourself at the center, it becomes all about you and not about God. You see, when you serve others, though, what happens, you're not trying to impress them because you're too busy trying to serve them. When you know who you are, you begin to live out who God has created you to be. You see, the Bible is full of promises about who God has created you to be. The Bible says that you are accepted, that you are secure, and that you are significant. Why don't I have to impress anybody? Because the Bible says that I am accepted by God, that I am secure in God, and I am significant to God. Listen to these truths from the Bible. In John chapter 1, verse 12, the Bible says that I am a child of God. And John 15 says that as a disciple, I'm a friend of Jesus Christ. That in Romans chapter 5, it says that I've been justified or declared righteous. In 1 Corinthians 12, it says that I'm a member of Christ's body. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 8, it says that I've been chosen by God and adopted by his child. I'm not an orphan. I'm not an outcast. I'm not a passion project. I'm a son. You're a daughter of the king. At Hebrews 4, it says that we have direct access to God. We don't have to make an appointment, hope we can get on his calendar six weeks out, that through Jesus we have direct access to God. We're accepted. The Bible says that you are secure. You don't have to wonder or worry, does God love me? Is he, I'm, you are secure. Listen to this. Romans 8 says that I am free from condemnation, that I can be assured that God works all things in all circumstances. God works for my good, that there is nothing in all of creation that can separate me from the love of God. In Colossians chapter 3, it says that my life is hidden with Christ and God. I'm secure. There's no wish, watchy, or wondering, but I am secure. The Bible says that I am significant. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, that I am God's temple, that the Spirit of God dwells in me, dwells in you. How about that? God takes residence in your life and in mine. In Ephesians 2 and verse 10, it says that I am God's workmanship. You see, what all of these things point to is that we don't have to be selfish. We don't have to put ourselves at the center to try to impress people because God has already, is already in love with us. God has, God has created us who he intended for us to be. So we don't have to run around trying to prove ourselves, but instead we can live it out. And when we live out of our identity, what happens is we put God at the center and we serve other people. And when we do that, we change the world. We stand on humility and we move the world. Now, the last part of verse three says this. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Can I tell you this true statement today? You won't serve, you won't protect something you don't value. But if you don't value something, you won't protect it. You don't take care of it. That's why I get so frustrated with my kids when they just leave their toys all over the place, their stuff, their tablets and iPads and all this. They just leave it on the ground as if they don't even care about it. They don't protect what they don't value. You and I, we won't protect what we don't value. It'll be easy to pray and to celebrate Psalm 139, verse 14. I, I celebrate you, Lord, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. It's easy to hold on to that verse when it doesn't have to change how we interact with someone. But you see, when we choose to stand on humility, that belief that God is fearfully and wonderfully made changes how we live. You see, it compels us to give the best of us to the best of others. That's humility. It leads us to a place where we begin to think more of others. That we begin to think, you know, I'm not the center of the universe and I'm going to lift you up. I don't care that it's your job to be my waiter or my waitress. I'm not going to sing holy, holy, holy at church and I praise you, God, that we're fearfully and wonderfully made and then go to a restaurant and not look 
my waiter or waitress in the eye and treat them as if there's divine in them. You see, every person we meet is, has the divine fingerprint on them. You know, Jesus told a story in Luke chapter 10 of some guys who looked for a way out, counting others better than themselves. That's what selfishness always does. It looks for a loophole, looks for a way out. But Jesus says, if you want to be the kind of person that changes the world, if you want to be the kind of person that follows me, that finds eternal life, you can't look for a way out, but you've got to look for a way in. In Luke chapter 10, it's a familiar story. It's the story of the Good Samaritan. It goes like this. Just then, a religious scholar stood up and asked Jesus a question. He said, teacher, what do I need to do to get eternal life? Well, he answered, what is written in God's law? How do you interpret it? So the man said, it is written uh, that you should love the Lord your God with all of your passion, with your prayer and muscle and intelligence, that you love your neighbor as well as you do yourself. Good answer, said Jesus. Do this and you will live. But looking for a loophole, he asked, and just how would you define a neighbor? See, selfishness always looks for a way out, looks for a loophole. Jesus answered by telling a story. There was once a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. And on the way, he was attacked by robbers. They took his clothes, they beat him up, and went off leaving him half dead. But luckily, there was a priest that was coming. You know where this is going. A priest was on his way down the same road, and as he saw him, he angled across to the other side. Maybe if that priest was driving, he would be coming to an intersection in downtown Dallas, and he would see that there was someone in need on the corner. He would angle over to the other lane. The Levite then followed the religious man, and he also avoided the injured man. But a Samaritan traveling the road came on him. And when he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him. You see, when you value other people, when you treat others as if they are better than you, when you see them hurting, your heart goes out, not your mind. You don't start doing the calculus and wondering, well, are they really going to receive my service? Are they, really, are they just going to go and waste this? Your heart goes out. It says, that's a child of God. The divine fingerprint is on that person. How can I help? That's exactly what the Samaritan did. And so he gave him first aid, disinfecting and bandaging his wounds. And then he lifted him onto his donkey and led him to an inn and made him comfortable. You see, he didn't do just what was expected. He went beyond to what was excellent. He went the second mile. And in the morning, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, take good care of them. And if it costs any more, put it on my bill, and I'll pay you on the way back. And so Jesus asked, what do you think? Which of these three, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan, became a neighbor to the man attacked by robbers? The one who treated him kindly, the religious scholar, responded. And Jesus said, go and do the same. You see, when we are humble, when we stand on humility, when we treat others as if they are better than ourselves, we look for ways to become neighbors for them. We look for a way in, not for a way out. And what I want us to understand about the gospel is that the gospel compels us to find a way in. It's not an excuse to stay on the sidelines. It's the very reason that we get in the game. The gospel compels us to go and to serve and to love and to protect and to value others the way that God values them. Understand that as Christians, no one should value life more than Christians. From the womb to the tomb, it doesn't just stop when it's a convenient political argument. You see, the value of life continues to the very end of life. Why? Because God gives every breath to every person. And if God thinks it's important enough to give a human a breath, then you and I have got to think that they're important enough to love and to serve and to care. What I want us to understand about this is that the world is watching how we treat other people. 
The world is watching how we treat others. And they are going to make a judgment not only about you and about me. They're going to make a judgment about God based on how we value and treat others. You know, many years ago, Brennan Manning wrote something that's as true then as it is today. He said the single greatest cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and then walk out the door and deny him with their lifestyle. That's what an unbelieving world finds simply unbelievable. Friends, it's going to cost us to value other people. It's going to cost us to stand on humility, to live out scripture the way of Jesus. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost money. It's going to cost time. It's going to be inconvenient. But I'm going to tell you, the world is running away from the God who created them because too many Christians are too inconvenienced to value the other. Listen to what the Proverbs say in Proverbs 24. Don't hesitate to step in and help. If you say, hey, that's none of my business, well, that gets you off the hook. Someone is watching you closely. You know, someone not impressed with weak excuses. Friends, God's not the only one that won't be impressed by our weak excuses. The world won't either. And if we want to move the world in the name of Jesus, we've got to be humble and think of others as better than ourselves. All right, verse 4 continues and says this, Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. You see, when we wake up in the morning and we make the choice to say, you know what, I am not the main character. Jesus, you're the main character in my day. You're the main character of this story. God, you're not living in my story, and I'm living in yours. And today, I'm going to walk. I'm going to interact. I'm going to talk to people, interact with people in a way that communicates that truth. And when we take interest in others, we show them just how important Jesus is to us. You see, when we take an interest in other people, you know what happens? We start Chick-fil-A in people. I'm not talking about going and buying them some waffle fries and an Arnold Palmer. What I mean is that we start saying, you know what, it's my pleasure to serve you. It's my pleasure to go out of my way to bring you something. Even though you got two good feet, you could get up and go get your own ketchup, but it's my pleasure to bring it to you. You see, when we begin to take an interest in other people, we begin to serve. It's like the most natural thing to do when we recognize that God is at work all around us. We just begin to say, God, can I be a part of it? God, can I join in? I want to value people the way that you do. I want to be a part of what you're already doing. In fact, Henry Blackaby said this in his incredible study, Experiencing God. He said, we don't choose what we will do for God. He invites us to join him where he wants to involve us. When we start taking an interest in other people, when we start asking God, where, where are you already working? Can I be a part? We start asking God, I want to be a part of what you're already doing. What happens is, verse 5, is that we have the same mind in us that was also in Christ Jesus. That we become sanctified. We become like Jesus we begin to see the world, not in despair, but in hope. We don't see all that is wrong, but we see that all that God can make right. That we don't look and, and see an opportunity to complain. We don't look and see an opportunity to, to go and, and, and be frustrated about what's going on. But we just see an opportunity to go and serve, to love, to live out the fruit of the Spirit, to love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, faithfulness and gentleness, self-control. That when we take an interest in others, we begin to have the mind of Christ. We begin to see the world the way God does. When we do that, we can't help but move it. Because when we see the world as God sees the world, it means we're standing where God is standing. That'll always be on humility. Because it's not going to be comfortable. It's not going to be easy. But I promise you, it'll be worth it. Not just because it's going to help you live into the fullness of your created purpose, but because God is going to use you to help others do the same. 
that I bet each and every one of us could think back over our lives and we could see someone, we can see in our mind's eye, we can see someone who lived these things out. They weren't selfish. They weren't trying to impress us. That they, that they uh, were willing to count me better than them. That they took an interest in you, in me. That they had the mind of Christ. And as we think about that person in our lives, we can look and go, man, I know Jesus better because of that person. And friends, what I want to encourage you with today is when you choose to stand on humility, you can be that person for someone else. And I can't think of any better way to live our lives than that. Let's pray. Daddy, thanks so much that you are the example of humility, that, uh, that you have given the best of you for the best of us, day after day after day, not because of our sin, but despite it, that you are busy giving the best of you long before we sin, and you'll be busy giving the best of you long after. God, would you help us to follow in that example, to let go of our selfishness, our me-centeredness, our sin, and to follow after you, to follow your example of giving our lives away for the good of others. Father, would our every day point everyone to you? Father, would you give us the strength to stand on humility, to move the world, to bring heaven to earth, today and every day. God, we love you. Thanks for loving us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hey, I want to thank you for being in worship this morning. I hope most of all that you found God in this place. I want to thank you for giving over the last couple of months. We have been doing a great job in doing that as a church, and I want you to continue in that. One of the ways that you can give, of course, and some of you already know that, is online, or you can mail that in. If you need help with that, contact the church office, and we'll be glad to help you with that any way we can. Also, when you're online and you're watching on Facebook, if you want to get connected to our church or you have anything that you need, if you'll make a comment down there and we'll be sure and get in contact with you in regards to that. I want to close in prayer as we give our offering this morning. I want to thank you again for giving and this money that you give, the tithe that you give, goes out to the community and helps those around us that are hurting and in need. If you will, let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you this morning for the blessings that you have given us. And we thank you, God. And, and Father, I just pray this morning that we'll be reminded that you're in control. You're in control of our lives. You're in control of this world. Sometimes it seems like it's chaos. But I want to just uh, ask that you give peace to those that are hurting this morning, that are struggling with that, that have anxiety and uh, let them know that you're in control. We thank you for what is being given in our offering today and ask that you use it to reach out to our community and those that are hurting and those that need Christ. And it's in Christ's name I pray these things. Amen.